name is Ethel Tungohan. I'm a writer, a researcher, an activist, and an associate professor of politics. This is Academic Andes. On the very first episode of the season, we talked to the brilliant Sara Ahmed about her new book, The Feminist Killjoy Handbook. If you haven't heard our amazing conversation, check out episode 40. In the months since we spoke, I keep returning to many of the things that Sara and I spoke about and the lessons I learned from the Feminist Killjoy Handbook. Over the last year, it became all too clear how dangerous speaking truth to power as a feminist killjoy can be, how institutions use progressive language to paper over long-standing inequities, and how exhausting it is to handle it all. So before we take a short spring hiatus, we want to bring together our own Feminist Killjoy Handbook Book Club. On this episode, we have three brilliant women, Rita Damoon, Tika Pinock, and our own producer extraordinaire, Nisha Nath. To start our conversation, I asked them to introduce themselves and to tell us who they are outside the Academy. My name is Rita Cordemoon. I'm someone who's aspiring to return to my Sikhi teachings and outside of the Academy. I'm someone who's trying to figure out what rest looks like. I'm speaking today from the Kwangan territory, and I want to kind of say that because I feel very mindful right now of the soil as I'm planting in the springtime and feeling connected to the earth and the soil and it feels really good. My name is Tika Pinnock. I'm a doctoral candidate at York University, hoping to be finished this leg of the journey very soon. Outside of academia, I am trying to be an avid yoga practitioner and I have lots of plant babies. One of them I'm struggling to to keep alive. It's so interesting. So I used to live with my mother who passed away a few years ago. All of the plants that she owned have died on me one by one. Mm-hmm. And so this last one, just trying to get it to spring, but it's, it's likely going to transition out too. But all of my own plants mm-hmm. are doing very well. And I don't know what that says about the cycle of life. So I'm here with my plant babies <laughs> and you know, to follow on Rita's note about connected to the land. I took a walk this morning and I was thinking to myself, gosh, it's such a beautiful day. The weather is nice. It's peaceful. The birds are out and it's good to recognize when we have beautiful days. Yeah. So I'll leave it there. And I am Nisha Nath. I am a mom to Emil and Celia. I'm a partner. I'm a daughter, sister, friend companion to Cindy Lou and Richie, <laughs> my my dog and cat, a gardener. I am a hopeful potter. <gasps> I am really trying to, to become that. Um, and then I'm also an associate prof at Athabasca University. Beautiful introductions. So we're reading the Feminist Killjoy Handbook. I wanted to ask all of you, how do we understand, feel, relate to, embody being a feminist killjoy? And As part of that, when did we first get the epiphany that we are feminist killjoys? Sara Ahmed talks about becoming a feminist killjoy at the dinner table, was curious to see whether there was such an epiphany that kind of defined your being a feminist killjoy. I can go first. So it's interesting that um, Sara talks about becoming a feminist killjoy at the the dining table, Um, because I think for me, it was also seeing... um, the dynamics of my household. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was about 11 years old, uh, I did part of my high school years in Jamaica and I went to an all girls school. And I remember at 11 telling a friend of mine that I had no intentions of learning to cook because I never planned to cook Mm -hmm. for a man and my would-be husband would have to learn to cook for himself. But then I had to think, why was that my thought at 11? And now really thinking about it, it's because I saw my mom do all these household chores and never got any extra thanks for them. Mm. Right. You know, she, she cooked almost every day. She was cleaning. She was taking care of my father in that social reproductive way. Never got any extra acknowledgement, right. Cause it was just the thing that she was supposed to do. And I remember thinking like, well, why am I going to do that? seems like a whole lot of work for nothing. So I decided 
I was not going to be that kind of woman. Mm. And then I had my maternal grandmother in the household with me, which the older I've gotten, the more I've realized she had an outsized influence on my life. Mm. So I met my grandmother in her 60s. She ran a small business. She used curse words colorfully. (laughs) (laughs) She didn't go to church and had told her pastor off many years before that, even up until her dying days, had no (laughs) desire (laughs) to go to, to church. She was loud. She took up space. Mm. She didn't cower to anybody. And so the older I become, the more I I realized like she was who I really wanted to be without being able to put words to it. And so maybe I've always been a feminist killjoy without knowing what a feminist was, without my grandmother probably knowing what a feminist was. We were just women out in the world living lives, you know, loud and fully. I really love that because when Mm -hmm. I was interviewing Sara and the book itself is threaded with references to aunties and older Mm -hmm. women who served as touchstones. So I really love how your grandma, who is loud, who cursed, who took up space, was such a formative figure. She was your feminist killjoy, right? Mm -hmm. She was. She was. Oh, that's great. Rita and Nisha, curious to see about your journeys too. Yeah, mine too. Mine too started in the household, witnessing the role of girls and women. And particularly in my family, there were three girls first, and then came two boys. And it was really sort of hearing and listening to witnessing the way my mum was isolated because she had three daughters and not had sons. Uh, And just sort of, I, been really noticing the pressure to get married, not wanting to get married. That was something I was very clear about, an arranged marriage. I did not want that. I grew up feeling very angry and rageful. I think now I understand it as sort of a feminist killjoy orientation, but I was Mm -hmm. angry about the way women were treated in our family. A lot of uh, domestic violence. I didn't want to participate in religious activities. Going to the Gudwara, like our temple, was sort of a daily practice. And I really resented it because it Mm. seemed incredibly patriarchal and sexist, which is so interesting that in my 50s, I'm returning to that now because I'm reading Mm -hmm. our teachings and they are not, in fact, gendered at all. Mm -hmm. There's an absence of gender. So it's our own cultural attachments to that. And I remember there being a cost, being told to be quiet, don't make too much noise, don't speak up too much, don't dance too much, um, don't be too visible. So I think my killjoy spirit really emerged in that context and grew in my late teens, witnessing police violence against a young black man, Stephen Lawrence, and he was 17 when he was killed in the UK, this was. And it was a really big case. And it took place at the same time as a case that got referred to as the Newham Seven, when seven South Asian, mostly Muslim boys, were also attacked by police in a local park. And they were not uniformed and they didn't announce themselves. And so that those two kind of issues really brought together my interest in thinking about feminism and anti-racism. We've been really mm-hmm. attached to those, um, the rage around those two issues. And the other part of it, which is I only kind of realized as an adult, was as much as I was angry at the women in our family for accommodating the men and pressuring me to get married, pressuring my sisters to get married, they were doing the cultural work, the community, the reproductive work. I also really admired how they took back their power at social events in particular. Like there was a lot of gender bending dancing that was happening, weird kind of spaces that they were occupying. They would really mock the men. There was a lot of cursing as well in the dancing. Over the years, I've really come to realize my mum was a really key figure. And she's on the one hand, someone who insists on some of the patriarchal kind of values. And on the other hand, she's taught me how to speak with my own voice. 
even if people don't like it. So mm. being the odd one in the family, I think that's really when my killjoy spirit started and brought that with me mm. to the academy. Thank you so much for that. And I will say, Rita, your feminist killjoy spirit inspires me to also be a feminist killjoy. Like I oftentimes think of your example and to know that mm. you're thinking about your mom and <laughs> how in hindsight you're like actually she was right like she was actually <laughs> subverting kind it's of cool. <laughs> different orders yeah. that's really neat I didn't know that for me it was like remembering this moment in school I think I was in grade four mm-hmm. and I remembered at the the beginning of the year the teacher had given us kind of like I don't know what you would call it, but like a a classroom charter or like an ethics for the class, right? Around like how we're going to support each other and all these things. And there was like, it was bordered by all of these cartoon children's faces, right? And so it was like this commitment, set of commitments. And then I remember later on in the year, there was a child in that class who, you know, had issues with bladder control and my teacher at one point he like just started teasing him in front of the class oh no and so i remember and i may be i may be remembering this wrong it's all it's all hazy but i i this is how i remember it as part of that kind of like killjoy ethos i remember witnessing that and then really swiftly going back to that classroom charter and pulling it out of my <laughs> desk and saying in the class, you know, you said that we have to to adhere to these commitments. You can't do this. Oh. Um, and I don't remember what happened afterwards, but I remember the feeling of afterwards. And it was a bad one. Like it was this like, mm-hmm. oh shit, what have I done? What? what is this going to mean for me, you know, for the rest of the year? And the reason I went back to that moment is because it's almost like all of those things that were happening in that moment just have get replicated over and over every time that killjoy kind of mm-hmm. comes into me again. So the, you know, the, the feelings in your body before you're going to speak out, speaking out because you know you've seen something and you're like this is not okay and then weighing really quickly afterwards that there's going to be a backlash so that's kind of where where I went back to in terms of remembering when I first became one I mean I was struck by you sort of situating that in your feelings um I mean I think the feminist killjoy is profoundly embodied Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, both in the kind of ways that Sarah uh, Ahmed talks about it and the visceral effect of indignation or refusal, as she says, but also that our bodies are actually giving us knowledge, right? That tense feeling of like, oh, shit, I'm, I'm like going to get payback for this. There's going to be mm-hmm. a price or the dread or the impatience or the anger. I mean, I don't think it's a stretch to say that while Ahmed is thinking about it as the individual kind of feminist killjoy, I think there's also a collective kind of embodiment of feminist yes. killjoys, right? Like I think of the three, you know, the three of you, for example, as sort of this collective embodied, like doing the work every day. Yeah, I think that's it's a deeply embodied work. I think if we can kind of talk about the embodied nature of being a feminist killjoy i think all of us can probably relate to that right like i i feel like i've been in situations with all of you and we don't need to kind of specify which ones on the podcast where you know we've done committee work or we've sat in conference panels or we've sat in spaces where i feel like one of the adages that ahmed says is that you know feminist kill i mean i'm paraphrasing but you know you know that you have another feminist killjoy in the room when you kind of make eye contact mm-hmm. with each other and roll your eyes mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. and and that's a side of kind of community too but i'm curious to see because all of you have in your own ways acted as feminist killjoy kill choice at specific junctures, challenging institutions, holding truth to power, right? Speaking truth to power. Was that easy? Like, did you do that in the moment? Yeah, I'm trying to, I mean, I think 
perhaps one of two things happen. It's the it's the kind of moment where it's like, oh, if I don't do this now, I'm going to, you know, burst out in flames. So just have to, mm-hmm. to get it to get it out. And then there's something else that I think perhaps happens. It's where you ask yourself, am I going to be, how am I going to be with myself if I don't speak in this Mm. moment? Am I going to respect myself Mm. after this Mm -hmm. moment if I don't speak, speak up? Uh, And I think it, it's much harder to get to that second place of being introspective with ourselves when we're in these kind of challenging positions, like one has to work up to that. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, it's usually one of those two things for me, because I would hate not to be able to look myself in the eyes the next day. Mm. There's this kind of thing. I remember, I can't remember who said it. it was somebody on one of those Oprah shows, but it's like, you know, everywhere you go, there you are. And it's, so I think if I have to be with myself all the time, I want to make sure I'm good with Tika at all times. And that, as I've gotten older, has been my my guiding principle of how I behave in in situations. But that takes time and a lot of grace to get there, I think. Mm. For me, I think that it's been sometimes just instinctive reaction. Uh, And I'm just horrified by some things that it's impossible for me to stay quiet and to do so would be to be complicit in a violence. And I think until I read Sarah Ahmed's work in many ways and, and in conversation with other killjoy feminists who, you know, we don't name ourselves as that, but that's what we are. And I can think of Nisha or Ethel Yu, but also Ban and Davina Bandar and many others. It, it is about a, um, like knowing that something is wrong and that it's okay to stay in that place of questioning, that place of indicating that you're unhappy and pissed off and angry about what is happening around you. And so there have been times where I felt like I couldn't be silent. And I remember that at grad school too, where one Mm. prof, you know, would make the most outrageous racist remarks. And during my comp exam also was really violent lecturing me about how I didn't understand that Indians from India needed to be civilized by the British, you know, and just like being raged, raged with that and pushing back and being very aware I'm in my comprehensive exam. I am going to fail this. Um, And so trying to articulate a response when all I wanted to do was cry with anger. And then there've been other times where I had very deliberately gone in um, prepared to Mm. Uh, armed with data, you know, to sort of push back against the racism in particular and uh, anti-Indigenous racism, anti-Black racism, anti-Muslim racism, particularly like those have been particularly the case in my experiences in the academy. Uh, And so going armed to like have people be unhappy with me and questioning them and expecting the eye rolls from the white men when you say, dare say the words mm. once you haven't seen. I love that about Sarah Ahmed, like sort of encouraging us to name and to use the words we want to use, whether that's inside the academy or outside the academy. So, yeah, I think, I think it's been profoundly hard. It has had a cost for my health. It has had a cost on friendships and, you know, being prepared to let some people go has been really painful, friendships that have ended, institutional opportunities. I think one of the advantages is that I went back to university in my late, in my early 30s. And so I was older and I cared less by the time I graduated in my PhD. So, yeah, I think that, you know, experience in that sense allowed me to speak up even when I was untenured. Oh, a grad student. So I think for me, you know, just listening to you both and then thinking about my own experience and then the book, I think also there's something about feelings. I mean, she talks about essentially the killjoy is about feeling all the feelings, right? And so, I mean, that's complicated. 
right? Because that, as you're suggesting, Rita, it comes with a cost. It comes with a cost physically, but it also comes with a cost in terms of the black backlash that we receive. But I think, I think in concert with feeling all the feelings and what that does in terms of motivating our action, what I also am taking away from what Ahmed is writing is that the feminist killjoy is also about like repetition, right? And it's it's kind of like a, a, a pedagogical assignment is what is the language that she uses, right? And so I think for me, it's interesting that we we trace backwards, but if we were to trace forwards from all of these moments that we've identified, you know, we have been layering on all of these learnings and also these cues for how to decide when to enter into moments strategically and to keep encountering that moment to use her language. So I think there is such a richness and complexity to to how she pulls together the the killjoy in that it's not only a posture or um, stance or companion that is about affect and reaction because that's where you lose power right if you're only reacting that is not a that is not something that fills us or it enables us always to exercise our power I don't think that's what the killjoy is, or, you know, as we talk about it, how, how we inhabit that. It is also about that learning and layering process of repeating. And then also to bring in what you all have said, too, is that we have killjoys whispering in our ears all the time, right? I mean, that is something that came so clear in what all of you brought in terms of, like, your family, women in your lives who are whispering in your ears constantly. And I will say, Rita, like, literally... I think yesterday I was penning an email and I heard your voice in my ear and it was kind of this killjoy or dissident friendship voice or whatever language we want to use, but you were there. So I think that's a little bit how I'm coming into this. I think this is such a beautiful conversation because one thing that I've been learning over the years is that these so-called spontaneous reactions, right? That there's only so much we can hold in. I've learned to speak out and I've learned to speak up strategically and to act strategically because of the lessons that I've learned on how to navigate these spaces. Thanks to people like Rita, thanks to Nisha, thanks to other people who have served as mentors for me in the academy. They may not know their mentors, but I model themselves sometimes subconsciously after them. But here's what's hard, right? Because I feel like we all talk about the risk that we face and we've all lost a lot of things, right? Rita, when you talk about losing friendships and letting go of friendships, I think this last year, I'm like losing people who I thought were allies, losing friends who I thought would be in with me, you know, who would be part of the battle. And that's been so hard. And I think one thing I'm realizing, too, is that um, my personal favorite Killjoy Maxim is or Killjoy Truth is we learn about institutions from trying to transform them. I'm learning that these institutions also end up kind of molding people's behavior and they end up corrupting us almost. Right. And that's that's why the figure for me of the feminist this killjoy is so important, right? Like using that, uh, you know, using this figure at the back of my head, hearing these voices, whether it's your voice, Rita, your voice, Nisha, our group chats, recognizing that there's always someone who's countering institutional mandates to do more, to say yes to more things, to do this for the institution, because otherwise the institutional will fail. But having that oppositional consciousness through these various feminist killjoy moments, I think is so important. And the figure of the feminist killjoy, that's what that has taught me. So I'm curious, too, to hear, you know, based on kind of your encounters in the academy and beyond, what what significance the figure of the feminist killjoy holds on you? I mean, I will I will say that, you know, Ahmed's uh, killjoy commitments really stand out for me. And uh, sort of picking up on what you've asked us, um, Ethel, like she has that one of her commitments is I'm not willing to get over what is not over right? Like we we constantly get the eye rolls from white folk about, oh, here she goes again. And then there are other times, and Tika, you made me think about this. Earlier, we were having a conversation just before we started recording. And 
something you said just emphasized for me that different bodies are read as different kinds of feminist killjoys, whether or not they speak, just their sheer presence and visibility in particular kind of racialized ways, right? As black or overtly Muslim or indigenous, you know, or trans of color, that different bodies are read as killjoys, regardless of what they have to say. And so the burden is carried disproportionately, I think, amongst feminist killjoys in in that way. It's definitely taught me, when Ahmed does sort of refer to this, it taught, has taught me about power. I would say that most fundamentally. It's taught me about noticing and naming where power is being wielded to serve a particular hegemonic system or and hegemonic people. It's taught me about ideology. It's taught me that particular kinds of ideologies are woven through our everyday life, like capitalism, like neoliberalism. It's taught me that there is this sort of happiness literacy. You know, that's her language where we're supposed to enjoy and certain things and be quiet, like, you know, sitting at a, a table and you've got colleagues making sexist comments, you're supposed to smile and find this very pleasant. But in fact, the indignation and the being anti something is not a bad thing. I think the feminist killjoy has taught me that, that actually the more I am disliked or seen as a problem, the better job I am doing as a feminist, as an anti-racist feminist. So my marker of how to understand myself and assess myself has changed as a result that that is actually, even with the cost, that that is what I want to do because that is what I value. And that what it's also taught me that there's a responsibility of being a feminist killjoy, that I I have a responsibility to people who are more precarious than me or that are paying more of a price than me. And my responsibility is to step up and step in in different ways. So, it, it, yeah, it's definitely taught me about power and ideology, those kinds of sort of everyday aspects, not just academically, not just theoretically, but like how they operate in practice. It's taught me it's fine to be serious and miserable at times. It's taught me about what Ahmed calls the happiness literacy, and it's taught me about relationships. I like that. I think this is a book I'm going to have to go back to and sit with a few more times as well. As I was reading it, I felt so seen in in the pages of this book. I think I sent an email saying that yesterday and I would I would read a sentence or a paragraph and I would text a friend and I'd be like, so I just read this thing. Doesn't this explain that thing we were talking about two weeks ago? So I don't know how she's managed to do it, but she's captured so much, I think, of our lives and our experiences and given us words to talk about them. And so I I like a lot of the equations and the commitments and the maxims, but there's like sentences that are just so beautiful to me that I circled. And, And one of them, it's on page 125, is, you know, the process can start with what you notice. And she ends the paragraph with, this is why I think of noticing as political labor in noticing the world we hammer away at it. And it's, I, I think as we all come into being feminist killjoys, the thing that clues us in is when you just start to notice. You know, thinking back when you're in the room with other feminist killjoys, it's that moment you sit and you look around and you look at each other and you're like, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Because this does not make any sense to us. And from where we sit, I remember when I I did my master's at LSE and I remember when I got there, there was something I was feeling that I couldn't quite explain. And I went to the cafeteria one day and I sat and I ate and I looked around and then I went outside and I saw the security guard and I was like, now I see what my body has been feeling. All the staff who work in the cafeteria, do the security work, do the custodial work, are black and brown people. And all of the faculty members are white. 
But it's one of those things where you could, I think you could walk around and not notice it. But then when you start to notice things, you're like, okay, now I have to, what does the noticing mean? What does it mean that I notice it? What is it saying to me? And what about what I'm seeing is making me on it? So I, I really like that there's this motif in the book of noticing and seeing things and being noticeable as well and, and being seen, being seen as the feminist killjoy. It's like you you are the annoying one and you become okay with being the annoying one because people see you as the annoying one. Right. So there's this, there's a thing of noticing and seeing which really speaks to me. And then there's another line where she's talking about she's quoting Angela Davis. And I can't remember the page number now, but she says, before the word, there is the work. And particularly for us as academics, I think we we like to theorize things because that's sort of the currency that we have in the institution. But recognizing that sometimes we don't have to theorize, we just need to look at lived experiences and it is what it is. And that not being able to put a word to something doesn't make the experience of it less valuable. So I think one of the things I'm taking away from it is noticing is a good thing. And when I notice things to to sit with them and to think about how I will then respond to what I've noticed and being noticed is a good thing. I love that. I just have to say that also stuck with me, this idea of noticing, but especially uh, several times she uses the language of estrangement. And I think, you know, just this process or the power of rendering something or estranging something or being estranged from something is, I mean, it's, it's something that many feminists have talked about in, in, in different, different ways, but it is so powerful because it is that moment where you are like, this is incomprehensible and that is political, right? And so I think that is something also that, that really stuck with me about kind of what it means to embody the feminist killjoy or have the feminist killjoy as a companion. But that that noticing is also about our own work, right? And so the other piece that I took away from it is how dangerous the killjoy is, right? And I I'm sure we all see this in our in our lives. Like I have witnessed killjoys, you know, at, at my institution and how vigorous that backlash is and how, you know, the machinery of white supremacy gets enacted to resist this dangerous finger, which, you know, there's a lot to say about that because that comes with very, very material costs to the feminist killjoy. But there is also something about being able to sit with the knowledge that one has the power to be dangerous and to to subvert, but that in that danger also one has the power to create something beautiful. So that's where I kind of got taken to in that chapter about the feminist killjoy as poet, right? Like we are rearranging words and worlds in poetry and we are making making worlds, we're reworlding. So this entire book has been like highlighted and outlined. And I think, you know, everything that ev- that all of you are seeing is landing. And I think the feminist killjoy as a figure is dangerous. And you do face a lot of risks in becoming a feminist killjoy. And a lot of us have experienced that, right? But the power of doing otherwise, the power of saying no, the power of just not adhering to institutional demands and doing something else, something better, something more beautiful, something more powerful, that's that's why the feminist killjoy is so important to me. So there are so many moments where I'm just like being asked to do things. And then old Ethel would be like, okay, sure. Yes. But then fe- feminist killjoy Ethel now will be like, but why? And no. Right. And so this is what I was trying to tell some of my students as well. Like just because things have always been done a certain way doesn't mean that we have to keep doing things that way. And there's enormous power in acting as a collective. And that's what Sara Ahmed talks about as well. Like other feminist killjoys, you all need to find yourselves, right? Because there's a collective ethos to being feminist killjoys, which I think 
distinguishes it, if I may, from white feminism, because the book also talks about paper feminists, right? Feminist white women who call themselves feminist killjoys. But as the book, as the book shows, uh, when push comes to shove, don't actually step up and are part of collective actions, right? And so I think it's that collective ethos of subversion. It's putting in place dissident relationalities, as Rita puts it. That, I think, is what makes the figure of the feminist killjoy so powerful. Absolutely. I really love these articulations that you're all offering. And I do think your point, Nisha, that it can be deeply dangerous. And we see that globally, right, around the ways in which feminist killjoys are naming violence against women or naming Palestinian dispossession. Just, you know, globally, there's a lot of those feminists pay a, a deadly price. So absolutely, it's da- it, there is danger involved. And there's danger in Canada as well, right? That isn't just a global issue. Feminist killjoys face violence, misogyny, you know, through through that. And we see this with the rise of the incel culture on the internet as well. And so, and but I love the sort of subversion that you offered us, you know, Nisha, around, well, that means we're also very powerful. In that, we can still make jokes and laugh. It's not like the feminist killjoy doesn't have a great time. We're just not laughing at racist and sexist and homophobic and transphobic shit. So... You know, I think that's really key for us to think about. It sort of strikes me that Sarah Sarah Ahmed is offering us something different, right? There's this kind of moment, I feel like, politically on the left, where there's a kind of an, an, a push towards turning away from institutions, turn, like not giving all of our energy to fighting against something, uh, like building um, mutual aid, building different kinds of communities. And I think what Sarah Ahmed is saying is that at the same time, we still need to be fighting the prison system. We still need to be fighting the university system. And so in that, these are some of the ways that we can take action and be embodied as inconvenient subjects that cause unhappiness. We want to cause unhappiness because, fuck, the world is really messed up. There is profound injustice and we need to step up to that and you can't switch that off like that's the other thing right like this isn't a part-time way of being it's an it's a life orientation which doesn't mean we have to take on every single battle because if we did that would be that's all we would be doing every single day on that Rita can I ask all of you though because one of the pieces that really made me think was when she talks about resignation too because Mm. the feminist killjoy does not have to take everything on and even this word resignation clearly has multiple meanings right in terms of what it means to leave why one leaves what political message that is saying and how that in itself also is can be an act that the feminist killjoy is taking so Mm. i'm wondering how that landed with others of you in terms of that passage around resignation. I think the quote that, and I'm paraphrasing, the quote that kind of stood out or the the section that stood out in in reference to that is, we all still have to live within the system we're trying to transform, right? And so in certain circumstances, leaving might be the only option, right? But in other circumstances, if you have the capacity to keep fighting, then you keep fighting, right? Like it's, I like that the book doesn't, although I did kind of feel like, okay, if we have to like live within the system that we're trying to transform, what if it's only certain bodies that keep getting tasked with doing the work of transforming, right? Like, isn't that exhausting? But yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. We might even just read a little bit of it here. It's just very short. She says, but resignation can be an act of feminist protest. By going, you are saying, I will not reproduce what I cannot bear. And I think that is really, I mean, that certainly has had me thinking about the spaces that I work in or choose not to work in, organize in, choose not to organize in, what I will do at work, what I will not do at work. And it also gives it the intent 
and the respect of it being a methodical decision, right? An intentional decision of political protest, which doesn't always have to be that you are in every space or voicing everything. So I guess, yeah, that that kind of withdrawal seems to be interesting, right? Because to be a feminist killjoy, she talks about this a lot, right? Around the exhaustion or the labor. Um, that's a lot. It's too much, right? We can't do it all the time. And of course, she resigned, right? She resigned from her position because of the repetition of sexism not being dealt with. And she stood in solidarity with students. So there's that kind of resignation, like the formal institutional. And then there's resignation, I think, also in terms of resigning ourselves. But there are some people who we thought were allies and not actually our allies. And there's profound sadness and disappointment with that. And then I think there's a resignation of which, like, as withdrawal, as you say. And withdrawal can happen in different ways. Like, you can still work at a university, for example, and still be withdrawn. I withdraw my labor or I withdraw being invested in making this a better program. I withdraw from an, another EDI committee. So there are different ways I think resignation can be deeply political and powerful in, in that sense. And then there's a worry around resignation. That feminist killjoy until I think I really understood the what I was doing and found other feminist killjoys, I think I, I sort of held it in as depression, right? Like the kind of withdrawal of hiding, resigning ourselves under the blanket and not moving and not getting up. And those are really hard. I think, Nate, like what the book does that I think I would, if I was still teaching, I would want to teach and maybe I will teach this outside of the academy which is you know part of what she wants us to do with this is or not teach it but have discussions with clubs yeah it's sort of give us she's given us a language so you know looking back if I'd had this earlier would I have fallen into the same kind of depth of despair probably not I would have found some way of like recognizing that what I was doing was okay it was politics. It doesn't mean we shouldn't retreat. That's where I think my mind was going as you were talking, Rita, is rest, rest and exhaustion, which the book talks about as well. There's sort of uh, rest as resistance, which, you know, Audre Lorde talks about this quite a bit. So rest as, rest as resi- resistance. But at the, almost at the end of the book, Zara talks about how, Power and violence work through exhaustion. And that struck with that struck me as well. It's sort of the exhaustion that comes from just trying to make it through the daily grind, just trying to survive, the exhaustion of trying to fight a system that doesn't want to change, is sort of hell-bent and not changing and, and turns every sort of radical potential and possibility of change. Um, into more of the same. But then there's also the, what is it's the radical exhaustion. I'm, I'm trying to find a way to, to frame it. It's the being exhausted with the system as well, right? Being exhausted with continued racism, uh, continued sexism, continued homophobia, sort of continued economic inequalities, uh, being exhausted with uh, a system that sees us as on the outside and as objects that shouldn't, you know, speak as bodies that aren't welcomed. And if we, we allow you in, you're meant to be decorative and not to be substantive in, in your presence, right? So there's the, how do we take all of that exhaustion and find each other to build these sort of communities of care, I think you've written about Ethel sort of, you know, distant friendships. How do we build the collective energies that we need to to face our physical and emotional exhaustion of doing the work, but to continue to be exhausted with how the system works? If I may, I'm curious to see how you think about the Academy after having read The Feminist Killjoy and being, I guess, compared to us 
what was the phrase you called it? Seasoned, seasoned <laughs> academics. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm no, a seasoned, seasoned adult. <laughs> adult. <laughs> yeah. Um, more senior, mid-career. I don't know. So uh, do you find that the figure of the feminist killjoy after having read this book, does that kind of show you the path ahead, right? In the academy, you're finishing up your dissertation. Does it illuminate other ways of being as you embark further in your academic journey? I think the first thing it does is to make me feel less crazy. And I do mean that in the sense of, I think, being a becoming, being a feminist killjoy, being anyone who notices things, you can feel as if you're the it must be you. And I, I think a lot of the stories in the book, um, folks who are writing to her was like, I, I must be the problem. Um, so I, I, I think at the, the very first thing this book has done for me is to break the isolation. And I have wonderful friendships with sister activists and, and sister scholars and, you know, and mentors, such as the three of you both in writing and in person. So it's not necessarily a an isolation that comes from really being the only one. But, you know, the academy makes us feel isolated in many ways. So on the one hand, it does that. And then I think on the other, I'll return to a point I made before, it's about being seen. And I think sometimes you need somebody who's walked the path before to be like, you're actually on the right track. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay to feel the way you feel. It's okay to think the way you think. And it's okay to not be too invested in the institution because you may have to resign in the multiplicity of ways that resignation comes. And so before getting to the other side of, of faculty work, it's already knowing that the institution is not here for me. It's not here to protect me. It's not invested in my well-being. Um, it's not really invested in my future beyond my extractive, the ways it can extract my labor. So when I go into it, what exactly is my Killjoy project? What is my feminist Killjoy project when I get there? What is the work that I am meant to do when I get there? And how do I find my Killjoy sisters to get that work done? I love that, Tika. I mean, I wish that this was like a weekly practice where we could come together as a drop in and we pose that as a question that we revisit every week. You know, what has the week been like in terms of this feminist killjoy way of being in the academy? I just, and, and I think it's incumbent on more senior people who are faculty and are secure enough when we're supervising to sort of facilitate that as a question for students as well and demand it of ourselves right not get too comfortable and demand demand it of ourselves so that's amazing I love that I mean if I can return to Ethel I know you brought up the paper f feminists before I'm not sure if people realize that it's obvious to others when they're paper feminists and I don't know if folks realize that others can recognize when what you put on paper and indicate as your scholarship is very different from how you behave in real life and with real people. Um, so I'll say because you're, you're mid-career, you're not, you're big sisters, you're not quite aunties yet, that we watch you and we see, we notice you. Right? We notice you. We notice the work you do. We notice the penalties you face. We notice the cost to you of doing the work that you do. And so for the feminist killjoys who occupy spaces of, of power, even if it's marginal, do you know that there's a group of younger folks, whether in age or just sort of position, who notice you? And you set the tone for what is possible for us. You show what is possible to us. And so when it when it gets exhausting to do the work that you do, we see you and we appreciate you, even if we don't say it in words. So hopefully that allows you to continue to do some of the work that you do. So my perimenopausal brain is like yeah. tearing up. <laughs> Thank 
you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's hard work to be in the academy. And I have friends who are now in their second and third years of their tenure track careers. And one friend said to me, she's like, you can't believe how intense sort of the system becomes on this side of the the line. Like as a graduate student, we are protected in many ways that we don't see. But when these are your, when the paper feminists, the ones who are just not feminists, the ones who don't care about feminists and feminism, when they're your colleagues and your superiors, it, it's far more challenging to do the work that you want to do and to do the work in peace which I think sometimes is just what folks are asking for too. If you're not interested in what I'm doing, just leave me alone to do the thing that I want to do. So yeah, I think I have a, as a grad student, I have a far greater appreciation now with friends who are on the other side too. You to know, this doesn't get easier. And I do think that's where unions, where faculty and staff are unionized, need to step in right, and create more protections for um, BIPOC faculty and staff to compensate for that extra time of labor that people are doing as a result of the positionality. You know, it's not the only solution by any means, but I do think that we need to be pushing our unions more to do that kind of work. Absolutely. And I think it's also making me think and this is a different episode, right? A potential episode. We, we need to put in structures to hold our, our labor unions into account. All of us are part of unions within the academy. I also would like to say, like, Tatika, I also get a lot of strength and energy from students and early career scholars who also hold me to account, right? And so I think establishing this community is so important because it's not, it's only... It's only through shared dissidence that I think I can thrive and, st- well, I can stay in the academy and perhaps even potentially thrive, right? All of us were part of this workshop just for Indigenous, Black, and racialized faculty and students at CPSA, the Canadian Political Science Association Conference. I still derive a lot of strength and, and I don't know, every time I remember it, I feel I feel a lot of love, right? But, but we received backlash the way, like we received, like, so, oh. well, you know. Well, of course, but I mean, there was a a right wing pundit who tweeted stuff, but also I know that in our, in our disciplines networks, there were some people kind of side-eyeing us, right? Like, why are you doing this space? Why are you creating this space? You're creating more divisions. But, but in any case, the point is, is that, you know, they're going to be unhappy with us anyway. So why not thrive together as a community? Who cares, right? We're not supposed to limit our actions based on what makes someone unhappy, right? Like, please. I do have one final question. What is required uh, of us to be a feminist killjoy at this current juncture? I think it, the current con- conjuncture is a, a challenging one, right? Where s- students are having to go to school with less funding available to them, uh, where anti-Black racism is very clearly visceral on campuses, uh, as well as off campuses, uh, where extraction on Indigenous lands continues. There's, uh, I mean, the, the state of um, Palestine, um, Gaza being decimated and by Israel. You know, there's just so many pieces to our present moment. I think part of what the feminist killjoy can do is share the costs of killing joy and try and protect people who might be paying a very high price so that the, the consequences of being a feminist killjoy are like not heavy, not just loaded. I mean, I know there's always the heaviness, but not just loaded on some people. I think that it's incumbent on us that where there is capacity and where there, what's the word, like um, where it's accessible to do so is to come together right, to assemble, to gather um, and build good, stronger bonds. I think that's really key. And then do fun things together as feminist killjoys, you know, like maybe we want to have a place of um, like 
what would we have in our survival kit? The question that Sarah Ahmed asked, like, you know, what would we do collectively? What would that include? Or engaging in more creative and art projects, feeding each other. I think that's really key. I know that there is a queer trans person of colour in Victoria who has been working very hard in feeding Palestinian families and they are not Palestinian. Um, So, you know, I think that there are many things we could be doing. um, And, yeah, so those are just some that come to mind. Two things come to mind. One is we, we've we been so undone by neoliberalism. And I know we talk about it in a very academic sense sometimes, but I don't, I don't know if we pay attention to how in the everyday it really works and what it means for the last two generations, two, three generations of our societies across the globe who have been raised in economies and societies where the individual is at the center of how we think about everything and how that philosophically reorients us to the world or orients us to the world and then how it plays itself out in political ways. So you think about unions and we need stronger unions, but unions only work if people understand what collective action means, right? And if you're thinking about the I, you're thinking about the individual. It's an- antithetical to col- to the collective and collective action. So how do we get unions to work? How do we get other collaborative frameworks to work when we've all been raised to think about the I and to center the individual? Like, I think there is some work, some real work that we have to do to re to reorient our societies towards the communal and the collective and the we. And then there is how the book ends, which is the equation impatience equals a feminist virtue. And I think in this moment, we have to be impatient. We have to be impatient with slow change. We have to be impatient with you know, not being transformative. Like we have to be impatient with reform. We have to be impatient with the way things get polished to use another phrase from the book and prettied up and how things get covered over with with diversity and with progressive language. I think we all always have to be okay with being impatient and saying, no, we want change we want it now and we'll, we'll we'll deal with the costs of it later because we know it's going to cost but the system as is is costing us way more i love what both of you have said and i'm feeling that word undone that you use tika you know i think when you phrased this question to us earlier rita around like what is required of the feminist killjoy in this moment you know that that is It's a hard question, I think, because this moment is a genuine crisis, right? Like it is an absolute genocidal crisis. And that requires so much of us all the time, right? Because Palestinians can't do it all. They shouldn't do it all. They aren't the ones that are complicit in the genocide. So I think I, you know, when Ethel and I have had the chance to kind of sit with this book for a number of months now, and I have been returning to this question around what does, what does this mean, right? In terms of, of what we do and the urgency with, with which we act and the impatience that we have to have or the insistence that we have to have. And, and, and one of the things too, that also comes to my mind, especially given what we've talked about of the the killjoy as collective and something that, you know, maybe isn't um, front and center in the book, but it feels imperative for us to figure out is how trust and solidarity can ensure that we can act in this moment. Because this is a moment that does require us to act collectively. And it's a moment where there is deep distrust 
right? There is absolute deep distrust amongst political communities that we thought we had. And so that doesn't resolve what we need to do in this moment. But I say, like, I, I just, I guess I say that it was such an important question that you brought to us, Rita, that I continue t- to grapple with because there is, maybe there is a time in which we actually need to sit with the feminist killjoy as crisis, right? This is a moment where everything should be incomprehensible and that should be motivating us to not let up in ways that might be different in other points. I feel like those are the perfect Well, this is the perfect question to end on. And I'll just echo what all of you have said. And also hearkening back to my interview, my conversation with Golzar about how sometimes we try to seek words to explain what's happening, but the words fail us because what's happening is heinous. What's happening is incomprehensible. And I think pairing that with impatience, but also pairing that with a call for accountability, right? It's not lost on me that... You know, Sara Ahmed in her social media was actually a staunch (laughs) critic of how people were reacting with respect to Palestine, right? Like she's been putting in stuff on her feed, talking about the need for us to grapple with the urgency of this moment. And for us to be feminists, we actually have to have a pro-Palestinian stance, right? And it's funny, I was promoting that episode in different spaces, one particular academic women's space where people were like, oh my gosh, I love Sara Ahmed, right? But then, you know, months later, or actually even weeks later, when another person posted about Palestine, there was just silence, right? And I was like, well, if you love her, like, yes. <laughs> why are yes. you silent? So I think this is a moment of reckoning. This is a moment of crisis. And we can't be patient anymore. We have to be impatient, demand accountability, and figure out how to work as a collective, as feminist killjoy collectives. Thank you all. Any, <laughs> any final words of insight? I'll just say thank you to you all, too. You just made the book resonate even more with me mm-hmm. through this conversation. So I'm really, really appreciative. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful <laughs> conversation. And that's Academic Anties for Season 4. Woohoo! We're going to take a short spring hiatus to recharge, and I wanted to thank all of you, our dear listeners, for sticking with us. This season has been heavy, reflecting the heaviness of the world right now. So I think it's fitting that we began and ended the season with Sara Ahmed's reflections on being a feminist killjoy. As much as our institutions want us to be silent or to punish us for being in solidarity with Palestine or for calling out institutional racism or demanding that universities and colleges ensure our safety, we will not stop being the killjoy in the room fighting for a more just world. While we're on a break, we would absolutely love to hear from you. Let us know what you'd like to see in season five of the podcast. You can email us at podcast at academicantes.com. You can also find us on Twitter, Blue Sky, and Instagram. And please, please, please visit academicantes.com slash support to find out all the ways you can support the podcast. This episode was produced by myself, Dr. Anisha Nath, and Wayne Shu. Tune in next season when we talk to more academic aunties. Until then, take care, be kind to yourself, and don't be an asshole.